Welcome, everybody, to the Old Time Boxing Show on the Grueling really Truth Sports Network. The Old Time Boxing Show is brought to you by the Retired Boxers Foundation. Make sure you check out Jackie Richardson and Alex Ramos on Facebook. I am your host for the Old Time Boxing Show, Mike Goodpaster. And right now I want to welcome in the Grueling Truth resident boxing historian, Chris Shelton. How you doing, Chris? Good, Mike. Uh, just uh, looking forward to... Uh... Last time we did Zora Foley and from my neck of the woods, and now we're in Cincinnati territory with you, electrical thunderstorms, and uh, Jerry Springer shutting down art exhibitions and the Cincinnati Rats. So uh, it'll be fun being as a Charles. I didn't know anybody remembered Robert Maplethorpe. And Robert Maplethorpe, yeah, the, the, the great one. Um, it was dated uh, Patty Smith, but yeah, the Cincinnati, Cincinnati didn't like him so much. <laughs> but, uh, Cincinnati kind of don't like a lot of stuff a whole much. That's probably true. But, uh, yeah. That's and I mean, come on. This is if this place is going to bitch about Robert Maplethorpe, but yet they built a statue yeah. to Pete Rose. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's uh, something else. Uh, uh, Pete Rose, uh, it's really, uh, I don't know. You know, he gambled, he has an addiction, but you know what? He said, why is my gambling addiction, why is my gambling addiction worse than a heroin addiction? I go, well, because heroin addiction. you know what? A heroin goes, addiction doesn't change baseball games. And... The fact that he had sex with a 14-year-old girl when he was 34 and married and admitted it in his defense was, I thought she was 16. Yeah, well, he's a, a, a scumbag, but, you know, since that's not a Oh, yeah, gambling, he's a you know, scumbag. Yeah, you, you, so you just can't. Even if you're gambling on your own team, you can't. You know that. So, uh, so a statue for Pete Rose and uh, Robert Mayfield throw up socks in Cincinnati Jews. Well, let them vote Jerry Springer back as mayor again. So. Well, hey, Jerry Springer is, you know, the reason he lost his mayorship was he was paying prostitutes with checks. He was paying with checks. I love that. Uh, well, you know, he probably uh, brought Steve with him, the bodyguard. Uh, yeah. yeah that's it's probably him and Pete with some 15-year-old <laughs> prostitutes. But let's go ahead and get off of that before we get sued. Today we're going to talk about the man who I think is the greatest athlete in Cincinnati sports history. Ezard Charles, who was the heavyweight champion of the world, and for my money, the greatest light heavyweight of all time. And when we rewatched these fights, I think that it gave us a greater understanding of how great Charles was, number one. And number two, I mean, it changed our perspective on some of the guys he fought. I mean, you can watch Ezard Charles, you know, give Rocky Marciano all he can handle. Rocky Marciano stated that Charles was the toughest man he ever fought. Charles is a guy that beat Charlie Burley, who everybody likes to bring up as forgotten great fighters. And he beat multiple times Archie Moore, just to name a few. So when you look at this guy's career, the 95 and 25 for a career record doesn't look that great. But when 20 of the losses were probably over his last 25 fights, you realize how great he was. And if you look at the quality of competition that he fought throughout his career, it makes it even more impressive. Yeah, the quality of competition in itself is, a, is something else. But also in these uh, uh, rivalries, when he faced people multiple times, he improved in these fights. He's definitely a, a thinking uh, man pugilist. And it sort of surprises me uh, uh, having to remind myself how unpopular Charles was as champion at the time. You know, these things just sort of happen, that you're in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time. And the things that Charles did that were amazing – he just happened to be following Joe Lewis, and that was just you made you know sort of unfortunate because a lot of uh, the, a lot of his accomplishments were sort of uh, were sort of put down. And then How about this, Chris? 80. Not to interrupt you, even though I am, but isn't it similar to kind of Larry Holmes following Muhammad Ali and never really getting the credit he deserved? It said, it said you know, the one thing Charles did, I think, may have been better than Holmes. Holmes bitched and bitched about it, and I think it made people sort of turn off Holmes' personality. While Charles remained a gentleman and sort of, you know, would have, could have almost faded into obscurity, but that boxing fans and historians and, and just lovers of the sport said, no, this man needs to be remembered, and this man is very special. And you're right. It's interesting to think that could, could he be the greatest lightweight, uh, a light a heavyweight in history when he never even got to fight for the title? Well, that's some things we'll talk about, and, and certainly as a heavyweight, uh, he simply he defended his crown uh, title so many times. It's just yeah, Joe Lewis defended it you know twice as many times or three. But because it's just that's you know the guy you followed. All right, so let's start off with he started his career as a featherweight in the amateurs, where he had a record of forty-two and zero in nineteen thirty-eight alone. 
He won the Diamond Belt Middleweight Championship. He followed this up in 1939 by winning the Chicago Golden Gloves Tournament of Champions. He won the National AAU Middleweight Championship in 1939. So that's going featherweight to middleweight in one year. He turned professional in 1940, knocking out Melody Johnson in the fourth round. He won all of his first 17 fights before defeating, being de- defeated by veteran Ken Overland, who was a solid fighter. I think Overland's final career record was like 120-something and like 15. So really, yeah, go ahead. I mean, uh, Overland was a good fighter. And Charles does have that, you know, an undefeated amateur record. I mean, that's just that's just really uh, incredible just to put that in, in its own right. And then, yes, to start his professional career, also undefeated. Uh, I, I don't think Charles ever got cocky, but you got to think at some point, you know, who are you facing? And, he, and this time he wants to get an experienced guy. I think, like, you know, Charles is still a teenager. This guy's, uh, you know, I think they're around 30, and just a very good boxer. Uh, uh, so uh, he probably, you know, uh, gave Charles a little bit of a, a lesson to think about. And, of course, I think Charles in the rematch at least got a draw out of it. Which At the time, it was his first draw, his first loss was to this guy. But, you know, it's a, it's a good lesson, uh, and uh, – and Charles didn't lose to some chomp. He lost to uh, just yet. Yeah, you go through you, you go through what you have to go through, and I just think it's amazing to have that uh, to be undefeated through to that point in his career as an amateur and a pro. Yeah, and the cool thing about the Overland fight, it was fought in Cincinnati at Old Crosley Field, and I found uh, an old Cincinnati Enquirer about it. it. The first six rounds were even. But Overland, it seemed, swept the last four rounds, probably do more to just experience than anything else. And the thing about Charles was he learned from everything. And he beat Teddy Yara's, which I'm probably saying his last name wrong because I suck at names. But that was at Music City Hall in Cincinnati. And Charles knocked him down for no count before the first round even ended. Ended up winning unanimous decision. And then he comes back and fights Overland again. And it pulls out, it pulls out a draw, which is, again, uh, something that, that's going to be uh, consistent in uh, Charles' career is the learning process. So when he faces somebody again, he's clearly a better fighter. And one of the things that, as we tag him a boxer, because he is such a great boxer, is we're going to hopefully tell the audience, uh, this guy can hit. Uh, it, 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 he does it not so much with the one-punch knockouts, but he, he hits with a flurry of punches with great accuracy. And, uh, and it, it's surprising the amount of violence that are inflicted upon his opponents as we go through this uh, list. Yeah, and then you look at it, he comes and he fights Charlie Burley, and he fights him back-to-back. And Charlie Burley, there's a lot of kind of mythical greatness of Charlie Burley. Not that he wasn't a great fighter, but I do think it gets a little overplayed sometimes. But Charles beats him twice, the first time at Forbes Field. And this is a middleweight. I think this really moved Charles into the rankings at the middleweight decision, or division because this was an upset over Charlie Burley. Yeah, and it's great to you know to for the for the fans who who do. I like the boxers who have their cold audience because uh, it's not really up to us whether it's deserved or undeserved. Just for whatever reason, you know, we get the sadder feel too. But some of these guys, it's just that whatever, whatever it is, they build a, a core of an audience, and it's great for someone like Charles because Charles fought him twice, beat him twice. Uh, so even in his, in his lifetime and as time passes, uh, it looks good for Charles to to take on somebody that has so much respect and really deserves respect. Uh, um, the, the greatness of anybody, the, well, boxing is so fun because we get to all debate and yell at each other. But uh, it, it's two good wins for Char- Charles uh, as he's moving up the ranks. Yeah, and then, d- as you talked about, he did better in rematches. The first fight, fairly close with Burley. The second fight, most accounts I saw have him winning seven or eight of the ten rounds, and he kind of dominated that second fight. Yeah, that's a, again, it's going to be a, a Charles pattern, and it's it, it, it's really just on him because the opponents are so different and diverse. You want to think, well, are the opponents therefore not learning or are not doing as well in the rematches? But really, the Charles consistency, he's the one learning. He's the one that's going to start uh, dictating what's happening uh, in, the, in the second and third fights against these guys, uh, certainly as the rounds progress. And it seems to be it's a bit tricky how he does it because the opponents lose. It seems like they... They've already lost before they realized what quite happened. It seems like they sort of thought, hey, you know what, I'm sort of doing exactly what I want, and the next thing they know, they're on the ground, or, or they've got a decision against them, and they're like, what the heck happened this year? And Charles is uh, manipulating uh, the action uh, in a way that's really quite clever and, and just, you know, again, piling up the wins against the, the names that we still remember today. 
Yeah, and another one where he fought twice in two months or less than two months was Joey Maxim, who he beat twice. Maxim, I think, weighed like 184 to Charles' 166 on average in those two fights. Once again, first fight fairly close. The second cl- second fight, Charles, from what I've read, really battered Maxim around the ring, especially over the last six rounds. The first four seemed like they were pretty close, but from there on, Charles just kind of took over. Yeah, Charles is simply just a better a better boxer, uh, period. And, he, and even when he was smaller, he hit harder than Maxim. Maxim's really a counter a counter a reactive person, and Charles himself is willing to sort of go either way. Um, and with Maxim, he, he certainly had his number. And it seems to me when I when I see Maxim against Charles, uh, Maxim really had to change his strategy. He I think he had to at some point decide he's going to dictate the action or try something more aggressive or offensive because as he allows. Charles to dictate the action, he's just losing more and more rounds. So, um, um, the, uh, yeah, Charles uh, had Maxim's number, but that's also because Maxim stuck to stuck to what he what he did as a, as a counter puncher, and uh, Charles was the, was the wrong guy for him. Uh, but they're they're quality wins for Charles, and you get a lot of quality wins off Joey Maxim. Yeah. And then there was a semifinal of a tournament set up to crown a duration light heavyweight champion, while Gus Lesnovich, who was the champion of the world at the time in a light heavyweight division, was in the service. Uh, he fought Jimmy Bivens. Bivens came out, knocked out Ezra Charles down, I think it was three times, and easily beat him. Bivens weighed 175, Charles 165. And when you look at that, I mean, he also, right after that, loses by TKO to Lloyd Marshall in the eighth round of the scheduled 10. Charles hit the canvas seven times during the eighth round, or eight rounds. It was dominated. So right here, you got to start to wonder what's going on. Yes, what's, what's, what's really a, a, a credit to Charles, because he has, he, has, he has ass whooping during these two fights, and yet you would think it's possibilities there for him to sort of lose his confidence or shake it, at least have his confidence shaky to a certain degree, uh, because he's been so so dominant. Uh, all he's really known is winning in sort of a dominance. And then back to back, uh, guys sort of you know made him look uh, made him look as bad as Charles ever looked in his career until toward the very very end. And uh, uh, Charles rebounded, but uh, but you know uh, the lesson is for Charles is, is a certain perseverance. I think we sometimes like to think we have certain fighters that we like that just have God's natural skills and. And, and Charles is an athlete, you know, he's sculpted, you know, really well. He works hard. But uh, this, again, is a thinking man's uh, a pugilist who, uh, who really doesn't get shaky. Actually, he, he displays very little emotion of any kind. No matter what's happening, he, he, he makes me emotional when I watch him. But he, he appears to just, I'm getting it up and get, go out to the next round, uh, no matter what happens. So these are two bad losses, but um, they had to be learning experiences. Um, uh, certainly with uh, what you might call what both of them they were. They were really worked. He, he improved against them the next time he faced them. Yeah, and we move on. A couple years later, he's beaten a bunch of guys that were like 500 fighters, maybe average, slightly above average fighters. And then he fights Archie Moore for the first time at Forbes Field in Pittsburgh. The judges scored the fights 10 to nothing, 9-1, and 9-1. He knocks Moore down once. I believe it was in the eighth or ninth round with a huge punch. But he beats Archie Moore. And now, all of a sudden, he's back in the mix. Yeah, uh, and, and Archie Moore, uh, the, the first fight, uh, is going to be three of them. Uh, yeah, he completely dominated uh, Moore. So uh, uh, that, that's, a, that's a, a really good one on, on the resume. Uh, Archie Moore, you know, of course, uh, many things. He was the greatest light heavyweight uh, ever, and uh, he's debatable, but certainly one of the greatest. And, uh, and Charles had his number, uh, and, and Moore just kept coming at him and coming at him. But, uh, but uh, Charles... Uh, Slicker, slicker, and, and you, you just scored a knockdown, at least one knockdown in the morning fights, and then uh, just would beat him. And, and the first one was a standing one. He said it was like 9-1 and 8-2, somewhere in that area of uh, dominance. Yeah, then next up, he gets his rematch against Lloyd Marshall, which was nothing like the first fight. He knocks out Lloyd Marshall, 57 seconds of the sixth round. Now, Marshall was kind of an orthodox stand-up fighter, and... Charles, basically, from everything I read from the Cincinnati Enquirer reports, and this was another fight that was at Crosley Field, Marshall rushed across the ring, opening bell, dropped Charles with a left hook. Charles got up, appeared more surprised than hurt, took a nine count on one knee, and then never turned back as he gave Marshall a beating. 
Yeah, so, so actually, I think Marshall. That's a that's a good idea. To, you know, you you, you totally dominated uh, Charles the first time around, uh, knocked him out, and then knocked him down right away. Uh, and and you you figure you just got to get in this guy's head. But no, Charles gets up, and uh, um, and from the newspaper reports they they're saying this was a magnificent performance by Ezra Charles, and I like that word magnificent because uh, uh, that's how I feel about Charles, and uh, and then that's. That's what the newspapers uh, call the performance. So um, uh, a really good win to come back from a knockout to uh, post such a uh, a, re- a to, to change the dominance into your favor uh, is really admirable. Yeah, then he fights Oakland Billy Smith, who he dominates, and then he gets the rematch against Jimmy Bivens. And Bivens was a guy that had beaten him before, and once again Charles comes out and basically flips the script. It wins the fight rather easily. Uh, yeah, he's, 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 he 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 gets their number, and and suddenly it, it turns from uh, Bivens being the dominating person. I mean, it was Marshall and Bivens are the dominating figures against Charles. Really kicked his ass, and already in a reasonably short amount of time, he's Charles has completely flipped the script. You know, by the, the, the second time, it's flipped around, and Charles is the better fighter. And then the third time, he starts dominating these guys I mean, easily, almost. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's really something else because, you know, sometimes when we deal with certain fighters, we can't even really quite find a rival for them or, or it's a little bit of a struggle. Charles has so many rivals that, uh, you know, we, we, we almost have to speed through them to a certain degree because he's going to have, uh, the, the, the quality names and he fights these guys, you know, two, three times. Um, uh, and yet, you know, what are we going to do? We have to keep the show moving along, but yeah, these are great, uh, uh rematch victories for him. Yeah, and then he fights a third fight against Smith and Bivens, knocks them both out even more dramatically than he yeah. beat him in the second fight, and that just kind of proves your point there. Then he fights Archie Moore, the old mongoose, in a rematch. This is about a year after their first fight, and it, it was reported after this fight because Charles floored Moore in the ninth. He wins the fight. It was close, but I think it was 5-4-1, the deciding card. But it was reported after the fight, at least at the Cincinnati Enquirer, that champion Gus Lesnovich was offered $75,000 to defend his light heavyweight title against Charles in Cincinnati for the summer of 1947. But he figured that wasn't a good idea. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things that's going to be unfortunate about Gus uh, uh, Lesnovich and uh, eventually the, the Englishman is uh, ultimately not allowing Charles to fight for the title. It does not look good for their legacy. And uh, the the second fight against Moore, yes, it was a majority decision, but, you know, uh, Charles did score the only knockdown, and uh, um, they, they said he, he picked up the early round, sort of, and uh, so anyway, he got a, a squeaker, sort of, but it, it, was, it went his way, and yeah, less of it's not fighting um, Charles. You, 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 I try to give these guys the benefit of the doubt, but I sort of think, you know what, uh, Charles has already sort of earned his way for a title shot, and certainly more time passes, he collects more and more of these victories, it, it's almost obscene that, that he's not being given a, a title opportunity. And it doesn't look good for Gus Lesnovich. You know, the, the Ring Magazine called him the, 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 the best fighter of 1947. Yeah, he's the best fighter if you, don't, if you avoid it. Ezra Charles, I mean, I'd be a great fighter, too, if I could get rid of all the people that are better than me and not fight them. Yeah, and then he loses to Elmer Ray. Elmer Ray was a heavyweight, 194 pounds. Charles weighed 175 for the fight, of course, Elmer Violent Ray was considered a big-time puncher back then. The thing here, though, from almost everything I read, this fight is close. I know the unofficial AP scorecard had Charles actually beating Ray, and one of the judges, Marty Monroe, had Ray losing 8-2 to two to Charles. The other two judges had it 6-4 to four for Ray. This is a fight that I did not see because I haven't found any video on it, but from reading, it was a close fight but most ringside observers thought Charles won the fight. Yeah, it's a, it's a split decision loss. Elmer is a quality opponent, and uh, Charles is going to dominate him uh, the next time around. But, uh, yes, it's just sort of unfortunate because it lands in the middle of that 1947. It sort of almost gives Gus Lesnovich an excuse uh, to avoid Charles. So, again, it's, a, it's unfortunate, but it's not, again, like Charles was, was a child. He fought a very good boxer, uh, and the, the decision just ultimately – Went against him. I mean, one person watched the fight and had a decision. They said, hey, I think Charles won the fight. Um, and uh, a couple guys didn't. But uh, the tr- and Charles dominated next time around. Anyway, I still don't think it does much for Gus Lesnar's uh, legacy. I still think that 
that all right, you need to get around to fighting uh, as a Charles, you know, um, you know, you're, you're done with your excuses, you, your war stuff, okay, that's understandable. Your injuries, all right, we stopped getting injured. You're fighting other guys injured. Why can't you fight this guy? Uh, so um, uh, Elmer Ray is an unfortunate loss for Charles, but again, Elmer Ray is a hell of a fighter, and uh, and Elmer Ray deserves his, his due. That you know is close either way, and uh, and good for Elmer Ray. <laughs> All right, then Lloyd Marshall made the mistake of wanting to fight a third time and got knocked out in the second round. And then yes. for the next, you know, seven or eight months, he fights some nondescript guys. Then he fights Archie Moore for the third time, and he knocks Archie Moore out in the eighth round, a crashing left and then a right dump Moore to the floor. And that was pretty much it. And with this oh. victory, it's- Charles maintained his ranking with the w- or the NBA as a leading challenger for the light heavyweight title. Of course, he wouldn't get a shot, but knocking out Archie Moore in the eighth round in your third attempt and your three and zero against him should tell oh, people exactly how good he was. And you're not catching an Archie Moore that's off his game in any of these three fights. Uh, he's slugging it out with uh, um, uh, uh, Charles. He, he's He's boxing well. He's just fighting a, a guy who's his doppelganger, but better in a sense. And, and each time, uh, Moore never knocked down Charles. Charles knocked down Moore uh, multiple times. And finally, this time he got the knockout, but not without Moore slugging out with him, you know, before he got knocked out. And, and uh, you know, a, a hell of a fight. Uh, uh, but it, it's a knockout in the eighth round for uh, Charles looks uh, damn good. Um, uh, yeah, and they're both riding each other hard in these fights. And, uh, and unfortunately, we're going to learn about uh, just how hard Charles uh, hits. And I'll let you uh, tell about the next one. Yeah, and then he fights Elmer Ray again. Elmer Ray made the mistake of fighting a rematch. Elmer Ray going into this fight was 192. Charles was 175. Ray was the second-ranked heavyweight into the world going into this bout. And Charles destroyed Ray. And afterwards, Chicago promoter Irving Schoenwald Wired Gus Lesnovich, a $50,000 offer to defend his title against Charles at an outdoor show in Chicago for that summer. And, of course, Lesnovich decided to turn it down. But when you look at this, I mean, this is another rematch where Charles just flips the script. Even though a lot of people thought he won a close fight, this fight was not close. Charles took Ray out in the ninth round, once again showing the greatness of Charles. Yeah, he did. It was very impressive against guys like Ellen Ray to come back in a, in a, in a rematch and, and score a knockout. I should uh, point out between the, the, the two fights, uh, Sam Rowdy fought it as a Charles, and as a Charles uh, killed him in the ring in Chicago uh, in the 10th round. He knocked him down. The first time Rowdy had gone down to 21 year old, he fought a hell of a lot of times. Rowdy killed somebody six months earlier in the ring, and Charles knocked him down for the first time in the 10th round. And Rowdy's acting sort of strange. He had one arm grabbing around the ropes, and the other arm, he's counting one, two, three with the referee, and as it gets to eight or nine, he starts to look like he's going to get up, collapses backwards, and he's in a coma, and he never comes out of it and dies. Um, uh, Charles retired immediately after the fight, but then uh, changed his mind, which is a good thing, but uh, boxing's a, a violent sport. Uh, uh, Charles killed someone who killed somebody in the ring, and, uh, and it attests to w- what, what happens when you take uh, Charles' uh, punches. Yeah, and when you look at this, the thing that stood out to me about Charles, and the same thing of Marvin Hagler, is a lot of these guys, after they fought Charles, were never the same. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think also, uh, you know, the, the impressive thing is, like, when you see uh, somebody like, uh, the guy I always think of is Gene Tunney. When I always, when I say, who, who could have maybe given the, the Muhammad Ali at his peak, you know, any kind of a fight? Now, we, everybody debates who they think even they haven't had a chance. But I always thought Tunney had a chance because Tunney's, uh, that they're hard punches and they're accurate, uh, and that's what Charles does. Charles uh, is very accurate uh, uh, when he when he when he moves in. You get hit with a lot of punches, uh, and uh, and they sting and they sting. And uh, um, yes, I think you you you're face you wind up facing more damage uh, than you think when you're one of his opponents. And uh, yes, they seem to though they fight Charles the first time around and they're confident. By the third time of these fights, Charles has knocked you out. Donald totally dominated you, and that you're no longer. Uh, who you used to be, though Archie Moore, you know, certainly, you know, took his three losses and and uh, and and didn't sweat and had a great career. But you're right, most of them uh, weren't quite the same afterwards. Yeah. Then he beats Jimmy Bivens again, beats Joey Maxim, and he gets a shot not at the light heavyweight title, but he gets a shot at the vacant title against Jersey Joe Walcott, in 1949. 
And Charles and Walcott, get this, each received 25% of the gates. The promoter got 50%. Um, a crowd of 25,000. And Charles wins the fight by unanimous decision in round uh, in 15 rounds. He won the fight on the judges' scorecards by four and six points. And now, even though he didn't get a shot at the light heavyweight title, Ezra Charles at 182 beats Jersey to Walcott, who outweighs him by 14 pounds. And Ezra Charles is the heavyweight champion of the world. Yeah, and good for uh, Joe Lewis, too. Joe Lewis is the one who uh, asked who he thought should be the, the fighting for his uh, title. Uh, Jersey Joe Walcott fought Lewis twice. He clearly beat uh, Lewis the first time with two knockdowns. And, and, and Lewis just couldn't hit him. You know, uh, Jersey Joe was so great with his foot shuffle. And then in the second fight, I uh, also knocked him down. Uh, so Jersey Joe Walker was very deserving of having a shot of that vacant title of Lewis. And then Charles was sitting there as the number one light heavyweight uh, contender who has an Englishman who never won a fight again, who won't fight him, uh, but holding on to the title like it's a, like a, you know, like a pope or something. Hey, like, anyway, thank goodness that, uh, that Charles was finally given an opportunity and uh, faced Jersey Joe Walcott. It's going to be very interesting in the rivalry. And Jersey Joe Walcott is really not quite on his game as he would the first time with Joe Lewis. And, uh, and Charles is, and Charles is, is simply landing more accurate, consistent punches uh, over the course of the fight, and I think it's a, a good decision. Uh, and you're right, uh, as a Charles, maybe one of the greatest, maybe the greatest light heavyweight uh, ever, but never got an opportunity to fight for the title, is now heavyweight champion, no. though some stations did not recognize it. Uh, they just, you know, they're little, they're pissers. They said, no, nobody follows Joe Lewis. Uh, and uh, uh, so anyway... Uh, as a Charles, well, we recognize them they, as the heavyweight champion, but some of the time didn't, and some did. The interesting thing is here, his first title defense, he weighs 178, and he fights, guess who? Gus Lesnovich, who was at 182, yeah. and, and he beat the hell out of Lesnovich. Um, oh, he from, beat him. Absolutely yeah. beat him totally to the point that, that Lesnovich's uh, tra- handlers really were smart and said, no more. We, you know, this guy's taking a severe beating. Lesnar's never fought Yeah, again. he could barely see uh, out of either uh, eye by the time the seventh round was over. Yeah, it, it, it was brutal. And that's one thing we're going to cover with Charles that, again, I think is a, that's really sort of amazing is that Charles does fight at 178, 182 in that area, and yet he probably inflicts more damage upon his opponents than almost any heavyweight champion that I can think of. Uh, uh, he just beat the hell out of Gus Lesnovich. Um, and, uh, and that was it for Lesnovich. Handlers said no more, and for Lesnovich, no more. That meant no more. Never fought again. Yeah, and another guy who had some eye issues after fighting him was his second defense was against Pat Valentino at the old Cow Palace. Yeah. And I think it wasn't the Cow Palace at Daly City or San Francisco, somewhere around there. Charles was a 5-1 to one betting favorite. Um, Eddie Mueller, the San Francisco examiner, called it the greatest fight I've ever seen. Eddie Mueller's probably never seen any fights. But this was a close fight. Valentino was a brave guy who had some skill. And after this fight, which he gets stopped, I believe it was in the eighth round, Valentino loses yep. sight in one of his eyes after the fight. Yeah, Josh, that's it. After, after eight rounds of uh, Ezra Charles, uh, Pat Valentino only has one eye for the rest of his life. I mean, boxing is fucking brutal. And if Valentino, you know, this is your opportunity to, to win the heavyweight title in your own home, ter- you know, turf, uh, San Francisco, and you're bigger than Ezra Charles. So uh, Valentino is a California state champion. Uh, wasn't cocky, but he certainly had reason to think, you know, there's the opportunity's there. I don't have to face Joe Lewis. Uh, I'm facing a guy I'm bigger than him. Uh, I'm not afraid of him. And uh, it, it doesn't very quickly turn around, though. It's subtle. Uh, and yes, by the, the seventh round, Charles is knocking him around, and 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 knowing that he's going to lose his eye, uh, it, it's awful to watch in the seventh and eighth rounds as Charles pounds him and pounds him, you know, to the eye, to, you know, because that's what you do in boxing, and and uh, and it's just awful that, uh, but it is what it is. So he, he knocks him down in the in the eighth round, and and down he just can't even get out. He doesn't. It's not that he quit. He just literally it, it, the numbers are coming back to you five, six, seven, eight, nine. And he realized, yeah, I just can't get up. And, uh, and that was it. Uh, so uh, a pretty uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, Charles not even fighting his own turf, you know, just uh, beat up this guy too. You know, yeah, um, Charles is a savage guy. He's not, a, he's, not a, he's not a cheat in some ways. I mean, some people think he held a little bit of this and that. But, but uh, you know, he's just a, he, he's getting, he hits you with accuracy over and over again. And, uh, and these things, uh, they, they have their, um, their damage. 
All right, then he knocks out Freddie Bishore in the 14th round, destroys his ear, and then he fights Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis yep. hadn't fought in two – huh? I just want to say on the Bashore fight, now you, because of, he's already killed somebody in the ring, he's just taking out somebody's eye. Bashore, by the, by the 14th round, his ear is the size of a watermelon. This thing is really sticking out of his head, and, and Charles is, is telling the referee, hey, I think you should stop this thing, and the referee – when he does stop it, which was just he, he had to, the fans boo and go crazy. They're not, you're just insane because how oh, did you stop this thing? Well, these boxers are getting seriously injured by not stopping them sooner. So I think the referee uh, really had no choice. And again, you're now he's facing another guy who Charles is, is really inflicting some serious, serious damage. I mean, a watermelon size ear, the side of your head. I mean, that's that that's sick and grotesque. But uh, you know, it, it's boxing at the heavyweight level. Yeah, and Joe Lewis, who had retired as a champion in March of 1949, over two years later, comes back to take a shot at Charles. Lewis was actually a 2-1 to one betting favorite coming into this fight. He weighed 218, which was the highest he'd ever weighed. And Charles dominates the fight. The official scoring were 10-5, 13-2, 12-3. Now, everybody except the British Board of Boxing Control recognized Charles as a champion. The BBB of C's champion was Lee Savold. Lewis had knocked out Savold in June of 1951, so the BB of C declared Charles the champion. So now he's recognized as a champion, even though he beats an old version of Joe Lewis. Uh, yeah, and uh, but uh, but I I will say that I think uh, Charles uh, would have been an interesting opponent, and, and Lewis has probably have no idea what would have happened, but 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 certainly Lewis had slowed down and hand speed. The hand speed advantage is tremendous with Charles. But it's also interesting to see Charles fight Lewis because he doesn't really he doesn't really box from a distance. He he really stays uh, into Charles into Lewis's range, and Lewis just can't get it off. You know, he can't he land that right. And Charles is even physical with Lewis. He spins him around. He keeps control. And they, I even love at the end of the 14th round uh, with one round to go, both of them are throwing punches at the uh, after the bell, which isn't really like a characteristic of either one of them. But but it really wasn't mean spirited. I think they just were competitors. And uh, and that Charles is, he feels it. He goes, I got this guy. I got to beat. And that Lewis is running out of time, and, and he looks really fatigued. It looks it looks it looks it looks sad as this thing uh, moves along. But you know what? Uh, uh, he's the same age as Drew as Joe Walcott. Lewis is in uh, Walcott looks great. And uh, and Lewis, it, you know, I get to lose this too. It wasn't like Lewis was trying to do this out of ego. He had to pay these taxes. That he didn't want to fight these. He, he really wanted to retire with dignity before the Walcott fight. And the U.S. government said, "No, we'll throw your ass in jail." So uh, that that's that's that, that that's very sad, and that's why they keep saying it's sad for Joe Lewis uh, uh, because he, he really didn't want to, but he had to. He tried to do the best he could, and, and this time he's facing a terrific boxer, hand speed advantage, who does have power, and then it's tricky. Uh, uh, just the things you wouldn't expect. You wouldn't expect uh, Charles to be so aggressive with Lewis. Uh, and, and still have such great physical energy by the 14th and 15th round. Uh, but, uh, but yes, yeah, a tremendous win for Charles. And, and unfortunately, sometimes it is taken down. Well, he, he fought a Joe Lewis that wasn't the same Joe Lewis. Well, you know, that could be a, a lot of boxing things. We all interpret things the way we do, but, but I don't think there's anything to suggest Well, there was a Joe Lewis that was still, after that, beating top 10 contenders. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, so uh, it, it, it is a quality win. It, it certainly, you're right, the fine game, the recognition. He, he is heavyweight champion. It's kind of ridiculous um, not to recognize him as such before. But nonetheless, um, it's going to sort of stay on him. He's like the Roger Maris or something. There's something about wanting to put an asterisk on Charles, even though, I don't know why, he, he fought a quality opponent almost, more than almost any boxer I can think of throughout his entire career. Yeah, the next up he beats Nick Barron and Lee Uma. The Uma fight stood out to me because it had two rounds that were taken from him for low blows. It was a rough battle. Uma was not a very talented guy. I wouldn't put him on the same stratosphere as even a yeah. Pat Valentino. No, he was even, and Uma was a little bit older, 34, but he, he simply was willing to sort of back away and uh, and uh, and he wasn't like hiding or running, but he certainly didn't. He didn't engage. His, his, his was defensive, but also uh, choosing here and there not to engage and then to engage. And Charles had to simply be patient with the guy. Uh, he's really not in any danger with Oma, but, uh, but uh, he scores the knockout. And the, the Nick, uh, the Barone fight before where he scores a knockout, I, he, Barone had never gone down. 
And uh, it was really interesting hearing Rose comment to that. He, he said, I, he said I, was, I was chasing Charlie. I was doing my thing. I said, I've got this guy beat. Everything's going my way. And the next thing I know, I'm laying on the ground, and my head is spinning. And I don't know why I'm on the ground. I've never been on the ground before. And then it's over. Uh, I, I, I got knocked out by a guy, and I had really no idea what was going on during the fight because I thought I was winning. And the next thing I know, I'm knocked out. <laughs> yeah. And then Charles fights a rematch with Jersey Joe Walcott which the decision is a big difference here. I think it was 80-70, 84-66, 83-67. Um, Charles was a 5-1 to one favorite coming in. The crowd booed the decision. Walcott complained he had been robbed. I don't think it was robbed, but I do think the fight was closer to what the judges scored it. Well, well it was definitely uh, 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 a, a, a better overall uh, Walcott, certainly in the early round. In the fourth round, he really knocked and hit Charles. Uh, probably harder than Charles has ever been hit by anybody. Uh, Charles is in serious trouble in the fourth round, and Walcott uh, is, is really kicking his butt. Uh, but then, uh, for, for whatever reason, because Walcott is you know, a great athlete and such, but Walcott doesn't seem to have, again, the same spirit he had, at least for the first fight against Lewis, and, uh, and he starts to sort of gas out a little bit. And uh, Charles is really just picking up rounds. He's just simply landing his punches, and, and, he, and he is uh, – uh, winning these rounds, but I, I do believe that the fans, their booing was just because Walcott lands harder punches. Walcott hurt Charles, at least it appears Walcott hurt Charles more than Charles hurt Walcott. But uh, uh, it, 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 it's just a, simply a matter of picking up rounds over the other person, and that Walcott, if he was going to do something, uh, should have done it. Uh, um, uh, because Walcott's going to look better in, in later fights against other people. So Walcott. It, I hate to say Walcott's coming into some fights more motivated than others, but it, it, he kind of is in a way because it's really his footwork and, and his kind of attitude. He sometimes, when he's on his, when he's on Jersey Joe Walcott with the shuffle, he's a very special, unique, uh, interesting fighter, but sometimes he's not that high. Uh, he's a little more flat-footed, and he's missing his punches on Charles. Uh, Charles is landing on him, and Walcott's missing a lot of these punches. And Walcott, I believe Walcott knew he was losing the fight because – he fights out of the last two rounds a little bit desperate. Walcott looks like he's aiming. He's got a hard punch. Uh, he's aiming for that knockout. And he, even then, you know, because he comes, he, that's not exactly how he fights, uh, he's missing that knockout punch. So I believe Walcott himself, despite everything he said, uh, uh, realized he was losing going into the final round and that I understand the guy he must be frustrated. It's his fourth attempt for the heavyweight title. He's like, God damn it, I beat John Lewis the first time around. What do I got to do to win? But that's that's boxing, and I do believe he lost. The, the he got knocked out by Lewis the, the second time around. Now there's some controversy on that too. But forget it, Lewis knocked him out, and then he lost to Charles two times. Uh, although he certainly rocked Charles, hit him harder than every sport. It's uh, impressive how hard Jersey Jersey a while but, but but Charles was simply more accurate uh, throughout the fight. Certainly as the fight moved along. Yeah, and then Charles beats Joey Maxim for the title, and then he loses the title. And what I think people forget is probably one of the 10 biggest upsets in heavyweight boxing history or heavyweight title history. Walcott was a 9-1 to underdog. It was his fifth attempt to win the World Heavyweight Championship. He puts Charles down for the count with a left hook to the jaw in round seven, and Walcott became the oldest heavyweight champion of all time at the age of 37, and that record was not broken until 43 years later when a 45-year-old George Foreman knocked out Michael Moore. Um, this fight was named the 1951 Fight of the Year by Ring Magazine, and this fight had to be a shock. Uh, yes, and, and Trisha Joe Walcott is back to the guy who fought Lewis the first time around. His footwork is incredible. He is boxing better, and uh, and Charles, quite frankly, uh, doesn't look as good. I, 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 uh, uh, Walcott is, is really winning pretty much every round. Uh, it's, a, it's sort of strange to see after uh, uh, that, that, that Walcott appears to be Dominic and clearly he's obviously also setting up uh, uh, Charles. And when he lands that knockout punch, the one punch knockout, man, I mean, Charles is down flat. I mean, this is one of those when the guy lands on the ground after that, after that punch, he ain't getting up. You don't even need to think about going to ten. This man ain't getting up. Uh, Charles tries and then wobbles backwards and falls back. Uh, I mean, Walcott clocked him, but but beyond clocking him with the one punch, he dominated him totally before that one punch. Yeah, and then after losing the title, he beats Rex Lane, he beats Joey Maxim, and then he fights Jersey Joe Walcott for a, you know, I guess it was the final time, I think it was the third time, Zach Clayton. 
became the first African American yeah. to referee a World Heavyweight Championship fight. Um, uh, from what I've seen at this fight, what I've read at this fight, extremely close. Um, yeah. I thought Charles might have edged it though, even though Walcott got the decision. Yeah, I can say I can see how you would say that. I would say it was very close, and I do think it's just one of those things where you you hate to take away someone's title unless it's a little more clear. And I believe that if Charles had been champion in the exact same fight, they wouldn't take it away from Charles. And I think uh, now Walcott's a champion, and I think rightfully it's been taken away from Walcott. If it's uh, you know in baseball, tie goes to the runner. Well, in boxing, title fights, uh, ties are really close fights. Or, or even sometimes when, you know what, the opponent even looks like they sort of won, but it, it, it's not clear. You just hate to take it. As, as, it's kind of one of the things we, we know about boxing. We hate to take away a champion's title unless it's just a little more clear. And when it's even close, even if the other challenger maybe, maybe did get the edge, uh, you still keep it in the champion's hand. And that's what happened in this fight, I believe. And I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, even though I, would, I like Charles uh, probably more than Walcott, even though I like Walcott a lot too. You know, I just, uh, but it is what it is, and I think you just don't take it away from Walcott, and that's what we boxing etiquette. So I, I'm okay about it. All right, next up, he fights Nino Valdez and loses. He loses a unanimous decision. Um, Valdez was a contender at the time, and then he fought Harold Johnson and lost a hotly disputed decision. Those two fights kind of seem to maybe take him out of the running to fight Rocky Marciano, and the Johnson fight, oh, yeah. I think, was extremely controversial. Well, yeah, I think, well, the Valdez was really disappointing because, uh, uh, as Charles said, I just stunk. I stunk. I had a bad fight. You know, that happened. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, Harold Johnson, who's a terrific, uh, fighter, uh, I, I think Charles uh, won the fight. I, it was very close. It could almost maybe kind of go either way. But in the, it, at the end of the fight, uh, the final round, Charles is clearly setting up his right. He's, he's clearly looking to nail Johnson with his right. He sets up the entire round for his right. Before the round comes doing it, the fight comes doing it, he lands it. He sets it up. He lands it clean. Johnson hits the deck. It's ruled a slip. I mean, what the hell? What's the referee? Uh, uh, what's, no, what, the referee is wrong. It's not a slip. It's a knockdown. It was a. It was a. It was set up by Charles perfectly and ruled a slip. Um, that's unfortunate because it could have been the end of, of, of Ezra Charles' career. It could have taken him out of the running for Rocky Marciano. Fortunately, it didn't. But but that's a real pisser. If that if if we, because of. What we know uh, of Charles when he did fight Marcino, you know, that that could have been taken away from him because a referee, bad call, bad call. Uh, close fight, but Charles scored a knockdown that wasn't giving him credit. All right, then he comes back and he beats Coley Wallace, and then he fights Bob Satterfield. Winner's probably going to get a shot at Rocky Marciano's title. This is a fight that was nationally televised. Satterfield, you know, nails Charles early, but Charles comes back and devastatingly in the second round knocks out Satterfield. Yeah, I, I, it was a, an incredible win on national television. Probably a fun one to watch. But also the Coley Wallace fight before. Coley Wallace, uh, Wallace is sort of a sculpted-looking athlete, but I really think it's interesting to watch Charles in his final 8, 9, 10th round because he's trying to get the knockout on Wallace, but he realizes that he's not going to be able to quite do it from slugging alone. He has to keep pulling back a little bit and box him and injure him and then start slugging out with them. And he keeps going back and forth. It's interesting to see Charles go back and forth to, to try to get this knockout as the time is running out on him. And then finally he starts knocking Wallace down and, and does get the knockout over the 10th round. It's a really interesting fight to see Charles, who knows he's going to win the fight, but thinks he's really got to get the knockout and impress the judges again after these two losses. Uh, and then with Satterfield, yeah, Satterfield, uh, again, has a cold, a cold audience. And, and Satterfield does what Satterfield does. He came out and he hit Charles really hard in the first round. Uh, and and, uh, and, and he's, not, he's a hard puncher. He battered Charles. Not Charles' mouthpiece. That it appears is going to fly out of Charles' mouth. I don't know how the hell Charles, like in midair, Charles <laughs> snatched it and held onto it. Uh, and, uh, and in the second round, Charles, just like that, didn't that happen to Satterfield uh, often? And turned around, Charles knocked him out in the second round. Had a very impressive, exciting fight on live TV. Uh, and, uh, and, and just terrific for uh, – uh, Ezra Charles, right time, right opponent, right everything, which uh, the man deserved because we want to see this guy fight Rocky Marciano. Yeah, and nobody was disappointed when he fought Rocky Marciano. And oh. Marciano said that Charles, toughest guy he ever fought. 
practically, I think it was close to 50,000 paying customers, had a gross gate of over a half a million dollars, and Charles comes out and dominates the first four rounds. But after that, Marciano basically just kind of bulldozes him down. And he almost puts Charles away in the sixth round. He almost has him a few more times really late in the fight. This was a close fight, though. I think the judges' scoring was like 8 7, 9 6, 10 5. And Marciano, after the fight, said that Charles deserved an immediate rematch if he wanted it. Marciano had a gash over his left eye that was open in the fourth round, which required 10 stitches. And, you know, he ended up in the hospital after the fight for an operation. Yeah, Marciano, uh, you're a Marciano fan. You had to be nervous during that fourth round. He throttled uh, Marciano. He dominated Marciano and uh, really proved that he deserved to be there. And it's just a hell of a fight. Uh, uh, were, were, were people disappointed? I might get in trouble for saying this. I'm going to quote Colleen, my, my, my girl here. Hell to the fuck no. I mean, Charles just keeps coming at Marciano. Marciano's pounding him and pounding him and pounding him and pounding him and pounding him. It, but yet, it, it, it's admirable that Charles just keeps taking the punches. Marziano on the left to the chin, on the right to the chin, on the left to the body, and the right to the body, and the right to the chin, and left. Just pounding, 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 and Charles would eventually sneak one in. And then Charles hits Marziano, and it's, it's just punch, 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 punch. Marziano's like a machine with right, left, right, left. Everything's landing with but both of them. Uh, but Marziano uh, just, just beat, pounding and pounding and pounding on Charles, and Charles just will not go down. And then suddenly knocks and hits Marziano on the again. It's, it's just, it's so exciting that, you know, here we are, we're going to do the show, and I've already seen fights, I've already seen everything i got to do. I said, you know, one more time, I'm going to watch, I'm going to watch this fight again just to see uh, Marciano pounding and pounding and pounding on Charles, and Charles' refusal to back off, and, and, and the excitement of saying, you know, when this, when this thing's finally coming to an end, Charles is the only one to go the distance with Marciano as champion. They're going to give both these guys a, a hell of an applause that they do, that they deserve, and, and the fans did. And, and Charles and Marciano, uh, I watched the pre-fight stuff. They had a lot of fun with each other, uh, their personalities going into the fight. And then it's a slugfest, most of Marciano and Charles, and just a hell of a fun fight in that sense because they're both really good sports about it. Uh, it, it went to the right person, and, and good for Charles for um, – uh, for hanging in there. I mean, Charles was trying to rough house with Marciano and trying to be physical with him, but Marciano is just a, these over the hands, these over the top rights and lefts, which uh, a smaller guy will do against a bigger guy. He's landing with these things with consistency, rights and lefts. Uh, Marciano is a machine when it comes to landing these punches and, and pounding on you, body, head, body, head. Uh, where, wherever you leave him, Marciano pounds. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it's a more exciting fight to, to prepare for the show. It's a more exciting fight than I even remember. I knew Charles in the distance. I remember thinking, oh, good, he had a respectable show. But I thought it was, just, uh, it was exciting to watch. It's exciting enough that I probably watched it five, six, seven times. And even just today, I just watched it because I felt like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to watch it again. Well, and, and the thing is, the rematch, it seemed to me that after those 15 rounds where Marcio couldn't put him, Marciano couldn't put him down, did Charles seemed a little more reluctant to fight, if you know what I mean? And then in the sixth yeah. round, you know, Marciano emerges from a clinch with this huge cut, which seems to enter, energize Hazard. He makes the wound a target and basically hit it repeatedly. And the champion showed that he had enough to stand up to this sort of punishment. But this was a fight that was close to being stopped with a Charles victory before Marciano finally got through and won the fight by knockout. Yeah, he, I, he he knocked uh, uh, down Charles in the second and stuff. I I do feel that you know there you, you can have a will. You know, there's no doubt about Charles. You know, will is an athlete and stuff like that. Uh, obviously, there's no question about it. But you know, Rocky Marciano, it's a it's a sort of relentless pounding. And uh, the, I mean, I give more credit to Marciano. I always like Marciano. I always think he's underrated. If it's possible to be heavyweight champion, he's undefeated and underrated. I thought Marciano might be it. But uh, I'm even more impressed with uh, Marciano, the damage he inflicted upon somebody. And, uh, and, and I do feel that, that uh, Charles doesn't quite look like the same guy. Even in, I don't know, in a certain composure sort of way. I don't know. But anyway, the finally in the eighth round, uh, Charles, you know, ducks uh, a Marciano, a right or a left. You know, he's, he's throwing both ways, ducks it, and then the next one comes at him like a, like a baseball bat to the chin. I mean, uh, Marciano is hard and uh, – and, uh, and and Charles was down. He, I don't know how the hell he got up. He got up, and then uh, and then Marciano was just hitting on the top of the head, the bottom of the head, the, wherever on the body. Marciano says, I, "I don't aim. I just I just hit." 
I just hit anything that's in front of me, and that's exactly the way it looks like on Charles. He's just pounding and kind of whatever's there in front of him, and, and it's, a, it's a hundred and some odd pound uh, Ezra Charles in front of him, and just pound, 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 pound this time, Charles, finally. Uh, yeah. You know, didn't get, didn't get up at a certain point. And that was... Against, uh, that was pretty yeah, yeah. much the end of Charles's career. He fought 23 fights after that, but he lost 13 of them. He was never the same as he got a little bit older. And the sad thing was um, losing 13 of his final 23 fights, I think the record turns a lot of people off today that, you know, everybody today is, is caught up in this no-loss thing. But when you look at the amount of times, this would be like Floyd Mayweather fighting Manny Pacquiao four times, fighting Marcos Maidana yeah. four times, Jose Luis Castillo three or four times, uh, fighting Ricky Hatton three or four times. That's not the 1940s and 50s. is nowhere near the game that we see today. And the sad thing is later in his career, you know, those financial problems forced Charles to continue fighting just like they did Joe Lewis. And this yeah. is a man who avenged seven of those losses in his career at the start. And, I mean, it's just it's a shame the way it ended because he ended up basically dying of Lou Gehrig's disease. Yeah, and, and, and it, all these fights are unfortunate because Charles is really taking a pounding that you wish he didn't have to take. And uh, uh, I'm not even sure how much they hurt his legacy because – People in boxing somehow have this hard on to put down Ezra Charles. I don't get it because this has been going on sort of throughout his career, uh, in, in a sense, and it's just it's ridiculous. Uh, uh, Charles fought so many uh, quality name opponents, uh, and and uh, it's it's such a, an astounding career. Undefeated as an amateur, as a as a heavyweight, he was, he was small. I mean, I mean, the courage it takes to always know you're fighting somebody bigger and stronger than you, uh, always fighting someone stronger than you. And yet, you're going to roughhouse them. You're not going to be afraid and get the best of them. Uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I understand that the fun of boxing in many ways is debating. Uh, you know, we have our opinions and agree and disagree. But uh, anybody who puts down the Cincinnati Cobra, uh, I don't want to talk about it. You don't, know, I, you don't know shit if you don't think Ezra Charles is one of the great ones. Light heavyweight, heavyweight, I don't care. Uh, he's one of the great ones. And that's most people, most people under the age of 30 don't think he is. Uh, I've, I've seen a lot of people, well, you lost 25 times. Shut the hell up. Um, the thing yeah. that's really cool is Charles ended up being very close friends with Rocky Marciano for the rest of their lives. And he was a neighbor and a friend of Muhammad Ali when they both lived on 85th Street in Chicago. But I, I wanted to know this. Did you see the 1973 yeah. commercial? that showed Charles in his wheelchair horribly disabled by ALS. I mean, it's absolutely uh, chilling to watch that commercial. I did not see that, and I, I, now I feel like I want to have to see it. It, it, it sounds horrible, because you know what? I already knew. I, when I see this guy with taking that much damage, if you could just see any fights, I'm like, oh, jeez, this guy is going to be in bad shape uh, after he hung up love. I mean, I didn't – I purposely sort of avoided – learning about it because I knew and so when you're telling about it you have to tell about it Mike you're well right see in ALS well, that's one of the causes of you know contact sports because I know that you look at Steve Gleason I mean Lou Gehrig was a guy who would you go back and look at newspaper reports of games was actually knocked out on a baseball field six or seven times and was playing the next day because he had that streak going to play in all those games so head trauma has a lot to do with ALS, and that's why we see so many football players and boxers that come down with it. And the thing is, it's a damn shame because Charles lived a great life. Um, from everything I read, he was a great guy. He was quiet. He was humble. And the sad yeah. thing is, guy, guys like a Floyd Mayweather that run around and run their mouths all the time get all this respect. Yeah. But Floyd Mayweather's career was nowhere near as her Charles. No, I, I mean, I, 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 you know, it's people like this hardcore uh, Mayweather uh, fans and stuff. And of course, you know, the man uh, is undefeated and such like that. But, but Charles was the kind of fighter that you enjoy. I mean, I don't, I can't imagine enjoying watching Mayweather. Fight. No, I, I mean, how many times and, do you remember paying for a Floyd Mayweather pay per view and then thinking, man, I really got my money's worth out of that main event? 
But, yeah, oh, exactly. And, you know, I'm glad you talked about the 73 commercial. Just to also tell the audience out there, uh, the, before their first fight, uh, Ed Murrow did uh, one of his shows on, on the two fighters. And it's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, but I, I think you had to tell your story about the wheelchair in 1973. I knew, looking at what I saw, oh, this guy is going to be seriously damaged. And I kind of wanted to avoid it in my own way. I'm really glad you didn't because, uh, you know, Charles had killed a guy in the ring. He killed somebody in the ring and took out another guy's eye. And you know, this is a very violent, brutal sport. Uh, we cover it because we love it, but we also try to be honest about it. And and and, and as, as Catholics, we, we encourage the amateur stuff, but the American Medical Association to this day I think boxing should be banned. But I'm still going to watch boxing. And I and uh, and as a Charles, we, we have to tell the, the, the tough parts about boxing. But still, uh, this is a well, guy. You know what? If they're going to ban stuff because it's dangerous, you'd have to ban cars and alcohol and all that stuff. Yeah, and it, and it is what it is, and and, and I'm so, I am glad that uh, that uh, you know I, I did things like as, as, I, as we were about to do this. I thought, wow, this is going to be a really uh, violent program for a guy who really, honestly, if you listen to him talk, he's a really sweet, thought-spoken guy. I mean, uh, I would imagine if you were wearing you know, a little bit of an overcoat or something, you wouldn't believe it. A million years, he was a heavyweight champion or a boxer at all. Yeah, and one of the greatest fighters of all time. And no matter how long they fight. In a boxing ring, which will probably be till the end of days, which may be soon. You never know. But Ezra Charles will always be one of the greatest pound-for-pound fighters that ever lived. Grate la la cobra. The the cobra strikes, uh, especially if you fight him in two or three times. Uh, It's a lot of fun uh, uh, dealing with Ezra Charles. And our show got delayed a couple times because... We're, we're doing it in Cincinnati this time, and they're using electrical thunderstorms. So I got the player of Arizona with my fighter, and I think we hopefully gave some kind of idea to Cincinnati and, and their great uh, champion boxing that uh, I'm very proud that we got to be part of uh, talking about. All right. In our next show, we will go north of the border to Canada to talk about one of Canada's greatest fighters, heavyweight contender George Chevallo. And that should be an exciting show too, Chris. It's going to be a lot of fun. He's a, he's a big guy. He's a fan favorite. And uh, uh, we, we were down to Oscar Bonavina or, uh, or I George think we Wallow already – didn't we already do Oscar Bonavina? Well, he just shows up in everybody else's uh, type thing. But, uh, but uh, we, we might still do him again. But that 12 is a good choice. We said, you're 12. The fans like him. We like him. And, and kind of go down the rundown of why he didn't become – heavyweight champion or where he just where he deserves his ranking because there are quite a few fighters and he's just in the middle of that pack uh and where do we think uh he lands when all said and done well he didn't become heavyweight champion because when he was a contender the heavyweight champion was cassius clay also known as muhammad ali right and and that is it is the speed of muhammad ali was not going to be good for george shavala but also uh, Ali didn't go out of his way to engage with Chavala like he did with everybody else. He's like, you know, this guy could really hurt me if I'm. And he did. Chavala did. He's playing these body punches that yeah. Ali. Well, we go through the show. Hurt. I mean, it's amazing the people that Chavala beat. Yeah, yeah. So, like I said, it's going to be a very interesting show because uh, uh, there are quite a few of these fighters, and some got him and he got the best of others and uh, never got knocked down. And just uh, it should be a really interesting show uh, uh, how, how it lands. All right, guys, look for that in the next week or two. Um, Chris, as always, it's been a pleasure. I want to remind everybody, we've been doing the Old Time Boxing Show for a couple of years now. You can find all the old shows at thegruelingtruth.com. Just go to the search bar, put in Old Time Boxing, and check us out. You can hear all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, on over 300 different networks. So anywhere you find podcasts, you'll find The Grueling Truth. Go follow us at... What? Go ahead. I just want to tell two two things I'm going to put up online. Cincinnati fights, 1880. Uh, John O'Sullivan, before he was uh, the, the the heavyweight champion, fighting in Cincinnati, gets arrested. It's a very interesting bout. I'm going to have to put that online. And uh, the 1899 in Cincinnati, the uh, colored heavyweight championship between a child and an uh, Armstrong. Some think it wasn't. But anyway, a great Cincinnati fight. I wanted to put up a couple of Cincinnati fights from the 19th century just to show Cincinnati's history of boxing if people are interested. Thank yeah, you, Mike. So make sure you guys keep an eye out on thegruelingtruth.com for all Christopher Shelton's articles. We also have great writers like Christopher Benedict who has had some great stuff here recently. So make sure you check us out. Make sure you follow us at Twitter 
at Grueling Truth. But for now, for Christopher Shelton, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.